Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in His consolation through Christ our Lord, Amen. Amen. So the topic today is surviving in an age of Antichrist. Um, it seems like. If you look on, on, the, on the horizon around us, that there is spiritual delusion that's all around us. And we can see this in the church, and we can see this out of the church. Um, I'm going to base this talk off of a concept that the Orthodox have called prelist. I'm going to critique, I'm going to give a critical um, take on, on prelist uh, based on, on its application and what it would mean um, through the history of, of our faith uh, in its various forms. And then I'm going to talk about what I think are, are legitimate um, uh, uses of a concept like prelist. And, uh, and finally, I'm going to bring it together with, with a way like how we should approach um, spiritual communion with God, really. When we're talking about prelist, we're talking about how do we listen to God. Um, and um, so anyway... We'll take it from there. So uh, let's open with a prayer. Mikael Himala Kakadosh again Aleno Bakav, Hagir Aleno Matana, Haresha, Vahara Mumiut, Shel Hasatan. Nisik Sivot, Hashemayem, Sorok, Logehenom et Beliel, Vet Kora, Shadim, Shalo, Shamis, Dovivim, Boalam, Umikapsin et Kovan, Aneshamot. Amin. You can see here I've pictured um, the idea of Belial as the puer eternus. So we see the spirit all around us as people who don't really care. They live for pleasures. They try to make a life. Uh, they try to make a most satisfying life possible. And that's what they see in life. Instead of living for God, we should be living first for God and um, not living to uh, find ways to enjoy ourselves or find ways to fulfill ourselves. That shouldn't be our goal in life. Okay, so... This concept of prelist, um, it, it comes from the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox. It comes from the, um, the Orthodox churches, uh, particularly the Russian Orthodox Church. It's interesting because it, it's, they, they, of course, write about it and include writings from the fathers, but it's not an ancient. It doesn't appear to be an ancient um, belief, so an ancient, ancient um, understanding, let's say. It appears to be, have originated in the first part of the 19th century in... Um, and what, uh, what from a, from a cursory understanding, if you look at the the a few videos online that are available, there's not much, and the Wikipedia page. But you'll hear about this concept uh, more frequently, even though it's, there's not a lot about it. Um, it. It appears to have been a polemic, uh, it's a, a, a diatribe against Roman Catholics, and talking about how Roman Catholic spirituality tended towards um, towards uh, prelist this 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 idea. So the person who initially formulated and wrote a book about it is Saint Ignatius Bryantinov. And so he's a Russian uh, Orthodox bishop, and he lived from 1807 to 1867. He was the bishop and theologian of the Russian Orthodox Church. He stands out as one of the greatest Eastern Orthodox patristic writers of the 19th century. So um, he kind of coined this. So um, the idea of, of Eastern Orthodoxy, um, and again, I mentioned that it's deceptively posited as ancient. I would say it's formulation and understanding and practice of treating it um, by name or by even a concept seriously in Eastern Orthodoxy is from the 19th century. It comes from the Slavic word for charm, seduction, or cajolery. And he, in the book, he accuses Saint, uh, he accuses Thomas Kempis, who wrote um, the Imitation of Christ, Saint Ignatius Loyola, you know the Counter Reformation, 
the one who um, led the spearhead against the Protestants after they began, and um, St. Francis of Assisi, one of the greatest reformers in the Catholic Church, of being led in large part by Prelist. Um, so we'll just read this definition. When used in a narrow sense, meaning that some particular person is in the state of prelist, it usually means that a person initially being on the path of a pious Christian life instead has become prideful and self-conceited about their own personal sanctity, believing themselves less sinful than they are. In Eastern Orthodox thought, the closer a person is to God, the more they see their imperfection, and all true saints consider themselves, in the feeling of the heart, the greatest sinners. The state opposite to prelist is spiritual sobriety. Um, if you're an evangelical Christian, you might say, brothers, God opened the door to me today, and he told me that uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. How do we know that's true? How do we know that's a spirit of God? Well, for the evangelical, they just beg the question, because I'm a believer and I'm born again. So they think that they're immune from having spiritual experiences that feel holy that are actually from demons, guiding them into wrong practice and wrong beliefs. Um, so typically it'll come in uh, the temptation of appealing to your pride. So I've had countless examples of where I have an experience and it's strong that don't trust yourself on anything. So what do we do? So just assume you're in spiritual delusion about everything, which I try to practice them. I'm like, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm experiencing. I need help. I need to go to the objective standards. That's your priest who's been trained in the tradition of the, not the, of men, but the apostolic traditions to the canons and the objective standard to judge in my prelist spiritual delusion because it feels like God. Is it God? You're testing the spirits and you test it by the objective standard. Is it in line with the teaching of the canons? Is it in line with the continuity of the last 2000 years of the church? Is it in line with what my father confessor has been saying? So we've got a checklist here um, that you can find. There's a Wikipedia page about it. And this is attributed to one particular um, father or uh, Orthodox father. I think it's more recent, much more recent than, than it's for the idea's formulation. But um, um, so again, if, if something that, if a dream or a vision or, or something that is indicating on your spirit, um, where 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 it affects you in terms of pride so in other words if if you see yourself as a big part of it um if you see that you're going to become get praise vainglory if you're good people are going to talk good about you anytime anytime you're seeking that or that is part of it or you can see that coming from it that you're going to be kind of lauded and praised that's a likelihood uh, indicator of prelist if you're approaching it with a weak mind in other words you you tend to change direction a lot or you don't you don't really couldn't call yourself a a solid uh, person, you're not somebody who's been the same for a long time, but you tend to to, to uh, go between different beliefs quickly. Then that's like that's a sign of prelist. You have an inexperienced mind, so again, you're new to this. You just joined the church, you just became um, into it, and now all of a sudden you're a saint and you're receiving visions, and that's a likely indicator of prelist. If you have reckless zeal, in other words, you have a cause, you need to get it done, it must happen, and you're going to pursue it no matter what, and you're not going to look on the outside. You're not going to care because those are just haters. Those are enemies of God who are trying to stop you from doing God's will. You're not willing to look at that. That's a, that's a sign of it. Very important one, disobedience, right? So if you're going against the, your priest or your, or your um, bishop or the church's teaching, um, then this is an indication that that you're that you're 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 likely being led by prelist, and so they would define basically all of Protestantism as a result of prelist. That basically all these people have started their own religions and their own. They have these other things that led to pride, vainglory, inexperience, etc. That then 
um, culminate in disobedience to the legitimate authorities, which oddly in this case would have been the Catholic Church for most of these Protestants, but they have an interesting relationship with that. Um, and they disobey their, their right uh, fathers, those who are in authority over them, and then they um, go down a path of prelast and start these many, you know, what is it, 30,000 religions or whatever it was. I'm sure many of those have fallen and more have started, but it's many thousands. Um, you're following your own will. And this is a really important one here, concealment of thought. This is one where you have uh, something that you think you've been privileged with and you don't want to talk to anybody else about it. And as you hide it, there's this sense that um, you, you become committed. It's almost like um, you can feel that pact inside of yourself that feels pretty, it feels dark. And I've had that in myself. When I was younger, I, I, I thought I had some secret um, revelations from God I didn't want to tell anybody. And there's a sense that you get really kind of thrown into a, into a dark place. And so I have actually seen this particular one, this concealment, um, this concealment of, of your thoughts or your visions or your dreams or your, how you're chosen or how you're elect. You gotta be very careful with these types of things, but th this, is, this is very real. Um, not knowing self, I think that speaks to inexperience and reckless zeal, et cetera, on weak mind. And not knowing the scriptures. So if you are not knowledgeable about things of Christ, and things of our faith, then you're not going to um, be, you're not going to be uh, ready to to uh, start a movement, right? Or to um, do lead some kind of effort. So it's important that you know scripture. So this is a checklist that um, you can use, and this generally does speak to almost most most of the talks you hear about it, and um, and arguments used in favor of somebody being in prelast. So now here's my problem with prelast, right? Um, if you were to take this concept, and I know they say, it's, well, that's a different time. It applies to a different type of person, and oh, there's no more revelation. All that ended with with the apostles, etc. Um, but if you were to apply this to the Old Testament or the Second Temple area, era, which is around the time of Jesus, uh, in the New Testament or the early fathers or the saints, um, you 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 would see um, what looks like prelist, but it is what is the foundation of our faith. And um, I, I can't reconcile, and I don't think it would be very hard to reconcile this concept with the practice and beliefs of the early Christians. And I think that's what Protestants are getting at when they when they're when they try to be led in the spirit and hear this voice of the spirit. They're noting, well, there's a real disconnect in the idea that everything is corporate and bureaucratic, and you follow just what has come before you. And this, and you have you have a you have the scripture, and then you have the canons, and then you have the teaching of the church. And apparently, and in Orthodox, you have a spiritual father like this one priest that apparently, or this one bishop that you're following. Um, that this is gonna this is gonna be enough for you to stay out of prelates. Um, but at the same time, when we look at, um, when we look at these, these, these historic figures that are really important to our faith, what they were doing was not prelist. And so let's just look at a few of those. So for example, the Lord speaks to Elijah at Horeb. Then the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord is about to pass by and a great and mighty wind tore into the mountain and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still, small voice. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I can tell you right now that a, an Orthodox, an Orthodox uh follower, is certainly somebody who believes in prelist, would initially think this still small voice was a demon and would think the fire was a demon. And they would go to look for authority to tell them. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but I'm just saying keep in mind that Elijah here would have been certainly considered in prelist. So the very foundations of our faith, Moses, Exodus 3, one day Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats and his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And Moses decided to lead them across the desert to Sinai, the holy mountain. There was an angel of the Lord appeared to him in, in the burning bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not burning up. This is strange, he said to himself. I will go over and see what, why this bush isn't burning up. This, this would be considered a false vision initially, because that's the, first, the way you're supposed to approach these things generally. And then when he heard God speak, he would have been like, this must be a demon. Certainly he would have done that. So just note that the, the different way that, that, the, that, the, that the patriarchs and our faith talking back, back in, in pre-Christian times approached their faith 
versus the way the Orthodox are approaching their faith. Let's look at this and contrast and realize this is not the same faith. And we just have to really kind of like let that settle, that this is a different way of living and thinking. 2 Samuel 5, go and tell my servant, this is what the Lord says, are you the one to, be, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent in my, as my dwelling. Whenever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Isaiah 39, 5. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all of your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, will, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So again, why would anybody listen to this? What authority is Samuel uh, appealing to? You know, uh, We have two parts here. We have, first of all, God giving this, this, this uh, first person account of why haven't you built me a house yet? I mean, I, you just imagine bringing that to, to a priest or a spiritual director, especially if you're Orthodox. Imagine bringing that to them and they'd be like, well, this, what does this mean? Why are you building a house? I mean, whatever, you know, they would, they would think this is strange. You're acting like a crazy person. This is obviously a sign of prelist. And then this idea that all of a sudden you have to warn somebody, let's say somebody prominent, an important person who's a big important part of the church, let's say the bishop, you, you know, something's coming for you. You're, you're gonna fall to your enemies and they're gonna take your children as slaves. Bring this message to them. Sure, yeah, the likely, the first response would be prelist. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't be, but I really think we should think about this. I think we should consider what that means, that we are immediately on an offensive towards what appears to be the Spirit of God. Now, this one is interesting because as Christians, we would say, yeah, I mean, they said, unless you're Ethiopian, you would say, yeah, Enoch is prelist, obviously. Enoch is a vision that, that is not in the scripture and nobody follows it. But let's just let's look at what this is a quote from from um, from Enoch. Enoch is entirely based on visions. And behold, a dream came to me, and visions fell down upon me, and I saw visions of chastisement. And a voice came bidding, I tell to the sons of heaven and reprimand them. When I awake, I came unto them, and they were all gathered together. And then he 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 then went forward and and told them about what he had heard of the chastisement that was coming for them. So he's talking about ministering to demons. To, to sons of hell. Um, so you can just imagine right now what you would hear from an Orthodox teacher about this. But you have to realize that this book, and, and not, not just Enoch, but the, the Second Temple period transformed the Jewish faith. So that we would have nothing like, our faith would be nothing like it is today if it weren't for the, um, the, the revelations of the Second Temple period, whether that's to Esdras, which I think is more respected by the by the um, by, by the Orthodox, or whether it's Enoch and the other other writings of this time, they we saw a transformation happen. We saw a transformation happen during this period, where where it went from a, a belief, no belief in an afterlife, questionably. Some believed in an afterlife, but but in the times of Moses and the early times of the of the Judaic people, it was about success in this life and 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 many progeny and wealth. But this switched under Christ. You can see this clearly in the Gospels. But this was born in the Second Temple period. This is born in, in this ancient book, Enoch, which was from about 200 BC, or the, or the books around it, the other writings and the other, and this is, a, uh, this is related. This is, a, this is a relationship with the Greek philosophy that was around them. This belief in angels and demons, um, of guardian angels, of heaven and hell, of spiritual warfare, the idea of, of, of the devil is the prince of the world and we're fighting the prince of the world. Um, Christians led by the Spirit. This whole idea, the backdrop of, in the backdrop we have is this, instead this, this spiritless Judaic faith. This, this, um, this Judaic faith which is talking about how to achieve victory over your enemies and have success in many children uh, with the Lord as your, as your commander. So we, we, we saw this transformation of the Jewish faith in the Second Temple period. All of this would be lost if we didn't care about the idea of angels and demons and visions and or we brought everything was treated with as much with as much um, carefulness, I guess you'd say, as as you get from the Orthodox. Christ in the Gospels. Just imagine Jesus. In fact, how could you not take the life of Christ, turn it to the Orthodox and say you would certainly be on the side of the Pharisees 
if you met Jesus. You certainly would have seen him coming to you in John 10, he'd say, I and the Father are one. You'd say, you're a prelist. Look at this pride. You go back to the checklist, right? Pride, vainglory. He's the ruler of the world. He's, you know, you would just immediately, he would throw him off a cliff, no problem at all. This guy would be, this guy would be the very definition of spiritual sickness. A man is not, a man is not, uh, it shouldn't be entered. It should be, a man is not, um, is not corrupted by what enters into his mouth, but by, but by what comes out, right? So he's telling them, don't worry about the, 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 um, the, the Jewish dietary laws, right? Don't worry about what you eat and what you drink. This would be scandalous. This is a rejection of the traditions. It's a rejection of the scripture. And he's saying this, it's a, it, he's not quite saying that they shouldn't follow the Jewish laws here, but he's saying something that is flirting with it. And they would have been like, this is prelist. If they believed in the concept, they would have immediately gone like this. He, where is he coming from? We have our rabbis and we have, we have the fathers. We have father, we have Moses, we have the prophets. We don't need this new doctrine, this novel doctrine coming to us before Abraham came to be. I am right. Think about the pride of that statement. Their angels always see the face of God. Small is the gate, narrow is the road. They don't even believe many of the, the Sadducees didn't even believe in an afterlife. And so they're looking at this and he's talking about the way to salvation and the way to perdition. These kinds of things would have been prelates. They'd be like, you're getting some dreams and listening to them and this is stuff that you shouldn't listen to. So we would have, if we held to this firm doctrine of prelates, we would certainly have rejected Christ. And then we have the, the desert fathers, St. Anthony of the desert. He sees, he sees, he has many visions and encounters with demons. One thing that does kind of speak to the, to the, under, the Orthodox understanding of, of prelists and their, just, their general treatment of the spiritual world generally is that the first idea is that it's a demon. Whenever you have anything spiritual happen, it's, it's a demon. And he did tend to curse and, and uh, curse out and, and have demonic involvement more than other things. Though he did have some um, visions and, of paradise and God and etc. But for the most part, his, his, he had a lot of uh, animals appear to him. Uh, that were that he said were demons that were coming to, to, to torment him while he was in in his cave or in his his place out in the desert where they had stored up food for him. Um, he uh, he he had this idea of a there was this demon in a dish. He walked up in the middle of the desert and he said, "I, I saw this dish sitting in the middle of the desert, but there were no feet that had gone up to it." And then he realized there was a demon, and he saw he he cursed the demon in it, and it disappeared. So um, this guy is, is basically following dreams, visions, um, mystical experiences. And this, again, if he went back to his, his Orthodox uh, father, he, would have, he certainly would have said, you're a prelist. You're not seeing any visions. These are all of the devil. Don't worry about it. And I guess that, that would have been you, you, the idea of having these great, these great teachers. You would never have them because... Um, they would be immediately put in their place and you make sure that things are at a nice rational level. So now we can talk about prelates in the Eastern Orthodox Church. This is a really interesting thing. So in the sixth century, there was, um, there, there was, there was a, a, a representative, he was a bishop, uh, the first prelate really of the Eastern Orthodox Church under Byzant in Byzantium and named Acacius. And he in advised the emperor to downplay Christ's two natures because there were a lot of people who believed in that um, in, in, within the, the, the realm. And um, this is in, was in contradiction to um, uh, a council that had been held by Pope Felix or that, that had put predecessors of, predecessor of Pope Felix had held. Um, and he was basically, you know, shirking or th throwing out the idea of uh, trying to downplay the importance of, 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 of uh, raising up the two natures of Christ. Um, both God and man, the idea that Jesus is both God and man. And Pope Felix told him to, re to repent. He didn't repent and he excommunicated him. So this is a, this is the Bishop of the West excommunicating a Bishop of the East, uh, who represents the, 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 the Byzantine emperor. So initially there was mixed reaction in Byzantine, Byzantium, whether that, that should be accepted. They said they, that they shouldn't, um, that, that he doesn't have any jurisdiction there. But some said he did, right? But later, everyone accepted it. So what this is a sign of is noting that, that authority had reached out and said, you need to reject this doctrine that you believe in on pain of excommunication. He said no, and he, in defiance, he said, I will not. And he was excommunicated by the Pope. 
And then he lived in excommunication and people, some rallied around him and the Pope said, anybody who rallies around him is also excommunicated. And a hundred years later, everybody with, with, um, in the years following, they came together and they ratified uh, Pope, what Pope Felix had done and they removed, they removed Acacius' name and all of, his, all of his supporters from the registries. The Catholic religion has always been preserved without stain. We condemn to and anathematize Acacius, formerly Bishop of Constantinople, who was condemned by the Apostolic See, their confederate and follower, or those who remained in the society of their communion, because Acacius justly merited a sentence in condemnation like theirs in whose communion he mingled. No less do we condemn Peter of Antioch with his followers, and the followers of all mentioned above. Moreover, we accept and approve all the letters of Blessed Leo the Pope, which he wrote regarding the Christian religion, just as we said before, following the apostolic see in all things, and extolling all its ordinances. And therefore, I hope that I may merit to be in the one communion with you which the apostolic see proclaims, in which there is the whole and the true and the perfect solidity of the Christian religion, promising that in the future the names of those separated from the communion of the Catholic Church, that is, those not agreeing with the apostolic see, shall not be read during the sacred mysteries. But if I shall attempt in any way to deviate from my profession, I confess that I am a confederate in my opinion with those whom I have condemned, However, I have with my own hand signed this profession of mine, and to you, Hormistas, 87, the holy and venerable Pope of the city of Rome, I have directed it. 88, whatever might be deduced from this explicit formula, one thing that cannot be denied is that throughout the years from 484 to the writing of this document, 519, the popes of Rome had kept their beliefs, terms, and conditions entirely fixed and unswervingly the same. Aside from certain dispensations regarding the names of certain bishops being le on Eastern diptychs, the Roman terms never were altered. O's terms had been characterized by both Puller and Denny as unjust and aggressive claims of universal and immediate jurisdiction. If by this time the papal claims had been proclaimed loudly and clearly, as many historical scholars testify, then they were still being so proclaimed by the year 519. When the Eastern bishops had rejoined the peace and communion of the Apostolic See, truth be told, the only side which changed was that of the East, which had, ere years of resistance, decided to remove Acacius from the diptychs and follow the rule of the Apostolic See. So this was from Eric Ibarra's book on the papacy that he, that he released last year as he recounts the interactions there. But it's interesting because basically you have this bishop who is not following his right authority, believing that he has this uh, communion with his bishops of his local region in, in uh, um, Byzantium, and he unites with them against the pope and uh, it decides to reject the excommunication of the right, rightful authority that they have through the, the, the apostolic see and is therefore excommunicated. And anyone who, who coordinated with him was excommunicated. And a hundred years later, even Byzantium and all of his confederate, all those around him who lived, all of the bishops in his, of his region, the great majority, signed this document. So... Um, there is, now what I want to talk to, I want to switch directions. So we, I, I've talked so far about the, the disconnect between a concept of prelice, this denial of the spirit as demonic, um, and, and the, 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 the pre-Christian and Christian faith, early Christian faith. You read things like the, um, if you read, if you read books like the, Pro, the prophet of Hermas, which was extremely popular in the first centuries of the church across the empire from end to end, um, this, this book would have been considered prelist top to bottom. Um, but this was the, this was a lot, this was a firmly, these, these were firmly held ideas that the spirit spoke to the servants of God, that God led his people. But, um, it, this is not reflected in an appropriate way, I would say in the, in the doctrine of prelist. So, um. Where is prelates? Now, there is legitimate prelates. We talked about prelates in the Orthodox in terms of their uh, auto, 
Cephaly, the idea that they have their own head and they don't need to listen to anybody, or they listen to their local bishop and that's all. So each bishop is his own prelate king. But um, instead, we should we should we should realize there is prelates in the Catholic Church as well, and and, and the criticisms that are often made against Catholicism. Um, in terms of prelates are, are legitimate. There are many cases, of course, under, in Orthodoxy and in Protestantism, but um, the, the, these are legitimate arguments. So a good example of when you want to see um, uh, a prelate in a Catholic sense, God called me to do this thing, and therefore I'm following through. This is a Protestant doctrine that we've adopted into the Catholic Church, the idea that we're called, that we go down this path, and we know because of just we felt that feeling of His call in our heart, the Spirit, and we're not testing that against anything. Um, when you feel, feel the Spirit is leading you and just following that alone and you can see, we've seen, everyone sees the Spirit is leading you to this activity that doesn't seem to be Spirit-led, that, um, that is not a, a moral choice, for example, oftentimes. Um, in, and then we tend to anthropomorphize, the other thing we tend to do in the Catholic Church is we anthropomorphize God. We take God and make him into a man, um, and not in the Christ sense that Jesus was in his time or Jesus is now, but instead, we make him into a man of our modern era. We turn him into a bro. He's bro Jesus, and he, he hangs out with us and fist bumps us, and, and he, he doesn't judge anybody, and he's really nice, and he's merciful, and he's really hot. He's for the ladies. He's really cute. Um, and this, this concept of Christ, this is a legitimate criticism to lay at the feet of Catholicism. And I'd say that these both of these kind of uh, two buckets come ultimately from Protestantism. Now, Protestantism is truly deeply in a legitimate sense of prelist. They lack authority, right? They say, why do I have to confess my sins? Believe in the Eucharist. Obey literally anyone. Do literally anything, such as go to Mass on Sunday. Um, why do I not, why can't I use contraception? And prelist is knocking at the door. You read one scripture, and then you read another, and you decide, I'm going to follow this one, but not that one, and this one contradicts that one, and I choose this one because it, it, it suits me better, and then you have your divorce and remarriage, etc. So, so um, Protestantism is a great, is, is through and through filled with prelist, and, and it's destroying the people of that, of that faith. And, and I wouldn't disagree with the, with the um, orthodox criticism of Protestantism on those grounds. So, um, so now I want to look at uh, what is a path forward that we can do. So how can we how can we instead move in the correct direction here, or or or, or um, what is the right way? So first of all, I would say that I would reject the idea that you call everything that you experience in the spiritual life first the devil and reject it and. Um, really, I mean, it doesn't have much chance of being of ever ever being resolved as being from God. The idea that the Spirit of God can speak to you, other than through the 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 corporate um, juridical structure of the canons and and your and your uh, bishop in and priest in the Orthodox Church, there really is no way to be led by the Spirit in Orthodoxy. Everything is everything is through this corporate structure, um, and so and I would say that's how it's manifesting, and that's a problem. That's a you know, fun, oddly, that's prelist is what that is. Um, but but w what is the correct way we should approach it? Um, things such as dreams, visions. How do we avoid that affecting us in a way that tells us something? Would destroy our faith. Know, we, not the, we have an experience like St. Paul. And helpful for us. First of all, take this great advice, and this is something that's on both sides, uh, both East and West say this, avoid spiritual secrets. Talk for talk to um, people in your life about it. You should people should know when you have your vision. Don't hide it for years, but instead tell people about your spiritual sentiments because they could be from God. But God will work through the body of the church. He'll work again through confession. Bring it to confession. Very important. Um, anything. Whenever you have a spiritual commitment, you made a commitment. You have a dream. You're led to do this. You hear this voice. You have this sentiment, this spiritual desire, and you bring this commitment to a priest at confession. You know. Um, if you have any plans you've, you've made or any ideas that you want to go do something or believe in something, make sure that you bring that to confession before you act it out. And I would say a traditional priest. And I, in, in, in our current situation where the church is in such, such um, disarray, I would say consider do, uh, bringing that to a, a couple of, 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 um, of faithful priests and also to your community, you know, to people like in your family, to your wife if you're married, your husband if you're married, to your father, your mother, certainly your father and your mother. Um, spiritual leaders in your community um, for any types of beliefs that you're that you're starting to believe in 
any plans and any commitments. And then, and then finally, and this would be in, in, in union with the, with the Orthodox. So both of these are, are kind of the same thing as the Orthodox say in, in resolving prelates. Make sure that all the fruits of, your, of these um, spiritual encounters are in line with the commandments of the church, the scripture, and um, your, your direct authority. But what's really important here is don't reject them out of hand. I would, I would, I would disagree with the idea that you should immediately say it's the devil that did it. That is an extremely insulting thing if God has done it. And let's really think about this. Let's say the devil did give you a temptation. In reality, when the devil tempts you, God is allowing that. And you know what? Through the darkest temptations of the devil, God works. And so you need to realize that even if, let's, let's, let's imagine a, a schizophrenic. Here's well, what should a schizophrenic take from that? Should they curse the devil and yell at him and say you're evil? No, what they should do is they should say, there's, you know, against that last, that last bullet point here, it would also be against what you hear at confession because no priest would say, There's probably some things I need to change in my life that make me into kind of a worthless person. Except that I have that that I have things that make me condemnable and worthless and pathetic, and I need to change them. And so what you should do immediately is try to make yourself into a, an upstanding and righteous person. So what you're doing in that case is you're listening and being constructively built by that criticism that you hear in those voices. Or if you have a dream, you know, that tells you, you know, go off and to another country and start a religious order, right? Well, maybe you have to take that again, put it against the church's rules, put it right to your confessor, talk to your community if it's something that, is, that you feel you should listen to. And again, you should listen to things you hear. But you don't go off to this other country. You look at what, how, what does that mean? That means you need to go out and you need to, you need to, you need to start talking openly about the faith. Take that in a, in, a, in a spiritual sense. You need to become less of an introvert hiding your faith from people and start to be, communicate more about your faith. You can interpret that in ways which you, can't, you don't have to ignore or reject anything that's hard to hear from a spiritual source. And even if it's a dark force, even if it's trying to get, look at what is a legitimate criticism and any criticism you hear. Look at what is something you can do um, good from any, any positive thing you hear. And also, you know, make sure you meter down and pull back from that which is praising you and lauding you. And go and realize that you need to you need to think of yourself as less. Anything that's a detracting from you, you need to realize it's constructive, and you can take good things out of all all comments that you would hear, all ideas that you're given, all dreams, all visions, all sentiments. So, just to give you an example, last night, last night I had a dream, and I'm going to listen to it, but I'm going to listen to it in exactly like this. I'm talking to you about it. I'm going to say, but I'm going to do it very loosely. So, I had this dream where I was in this this. Um, this this fortress or maybe like a, it was like a military facility maybe and I was like uh, it was involved in some kind of management there I had one person with me and we had to guard these three doors so we would go down as kind of everything's electronically managed and um, everything's very technical um, and mechanized but there's three doors there's one to the left front one to the left right one to the front right and one to the, one on the right as you can see in this image here and there's a group of of I would say like leather jacket, imagine American like uh like like ruffians, right? But then they're kinda of, but they're but they're clearly they got machine guns and stuff and they look like they're almost like a religious like like aggressive force. Like last week um the Israelis were attacked by uh by thousands of Palestinians. Um it's called the uh they called it the Al Haqsa flood, where they came to to liberate the furthest mosque in Jerusalem. And, um, and when they did that, they murdered um, thousands of civilians. And so you'd see this group that's militant, that's kind of made of ruffians from the community that's trying to get in through that front left door, right? The door on the right is closed. The door on the, the, door on the front, right, front right is also closed. Well, what happens is that um, we notice, me and the person who's with me, I don't know if it's a male or female, my companion, that the, the door on the far right is wide open all of a sudden. Right, so she or he goes and runs to close the door, but then I look and that front, the front right door door is then open, right? And all of that crowd that was sitting at the front left door runs to the front right door to come in, and they come in with machine guns, etc., and they're shooting. And I'm not afraid, but I go off to the side, kind of trying to avoid getting shot um, as they're running in, and and they continue shooting and stuff in the dream ends as they're coming in. 
So I'm looking at this and I, I treat this seriously. So do I know what it means? I do not know what it means. And I have to immediately say that. Do I understand it? Can I take things from it? And so like, yeah, I could look at it and I could have like these loose ideas that I'm going to use like, um, like you might see, uh, you know, you try to do it in a humble way and realize, okay, so what do I have in front of me? And I look at it and I can look at it and say, well, we have in front of us a church on the left, which I would say something like the Novus Ordo and the um and and, and the, that sentiment the novus ordo sentiment led by the spirit of the council spirit of vatican II, etc this new way of thinking in the church which is like the door on the left we have a front right which is going to be like um saint benedict's or the or the the um latin um um latin latin extraordinary form churches on on the right and then you have the right over here which is like the sspx maybe the fssp but i'd say probably the sspx for the most part so I can see these three things, and I don't know that this is what it's about, but I'm thinking about this. I'm just considering this because I can kind of, that's how we should approach it. We should realize we're children. We don't know. But I look at it and I say, so the door on the right is wide open, and right, the SSPX door is wide open to infiltration because that doesn't have authority. It's rejected authority. So I can, that makes sense to me, the idea that the far right door would be wide open all of a sudden. But then what I don't realize is that the front right door, which we go to Latin Mass every week, that the, the, the extraordinary form door in this case, is then all of the sudden opened and they're rushing through that door. They, we thought they were going to come through the left door, but instead they come through the right front door. Is this mystical? I believe that dreams are generally guided. So yes, I look at this and I think this is something. Does that mean I'm going to go run after something and do something? No, but I'm going to consider it. And I'm going to treat it seriously because we owe that to God. Any sentiment you have in a dream, a vision, any urge you have, anything you open in the scripture on the day that speaks to you that day, you need to be open to the spirit. And this rejection of all that happens spiritually in your life as a uh, danger of prelates is something that we need to be very careful to avoid. So thanks, everybody. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke and we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell, Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world, seeking the ruin of souls, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.